<clears throat> but hello, everybody. Um, this is the uh, session on collaborative workflows for remote controlled robotic fabrication. So we're going to see some exciting stuff from Julian and Sayed, and I will pass it over to you two uh, to give a quick introduction. Audio is on. Hi, thanks for, for having us for this session. I'll start by sharing my screen and send you into that wormhole, which we were already looking at earlier on. Um, there we go. That's a pretty amazing effect. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, share a number of projects that really talk about collaborative frameworks from an engineering perspective. Um, there will be both from different backgrounds in academia and also from, from the office I'm working in. And when we talk about these forms of collaboration, um, it's always um, a question about the people that are collaborating, at least for me. So it's, it's less, or it's one part is about the software that needs to collaborate, and the other part is, is the people behind it. I'm fortunate to have two teams of people that I'm currently working with. The one is um, where also Sai Mobin is from here in University of Kassel, where we're researching different subjects around structural design. And the other team is uh, my engineering office in Stuttgart, uh, where we're dealing with a lot of lightweight and special structures and also developing software, in this case, Kiwi and um, isogeometric analysis software, which is integrated into Rhino. It's an open software, not open source yet, as I just learned from Dimitri in the parallel session that um, it's important to differentiate. Um, and really, all the things that were discussed just now in the parallel or in the, in the session before about open and open source software are questions that we're asking ourselves. For now, Kiwi is totally open for everyone, free to use, and really we're doing this um, to enable us and colleagues um, to seamlessly collaborate in different software environments. Um, we will be sharing four projects in a little bit more detail. I'll kick off with the first one, which is a, um, an installation that I built with students at the University of Hamburg. And then Mobin will show two projects, and at the end, I will give a bit more of an industrial perspective from our office on it. So I'll kick things off with this first project. Um, this was built as part of my visiting professorship in, at the HCU Hamburg, where I had students from both architecture and engineering. I had just finished my PhD at the um, University of Stuttgart with Jan Knippers, and a lot of you will know the pavilions that we built in Stuttgart together with Achim Menges. And what I noticed as a researcher in this pavilion project is that usually uh, we had one or two hugely talented students which were looking after the computational part of the project and they were kind of sitting in their studios with headphones on and um, kind of totally beamed away into their software world and then there was a bunch of 20 odd students around them that were kind of doing all the hands-on work um, but it was hardly ever achieved that we had the 20 students collaborate in the software environment. It was usually only down to one or two really talented people. So the aim in Hamburg was that I wanted to have everyone work on a central model. At that point, uh, that was the advent of Flux, a cloud-based collaboration possibility for especially for different grasshopper scripts which we could connect on the cloud and um, you will know all the story how flux then disappeared when it was commercialized um, and we took a long time uh, sketching out different ideas how we can um, make these different collaboration environments and set up a data tree that we can work with and we wanted to work in a way that what we were doing in physical model building, what we were doing in engineering software, um, in the software environments that we're using for simulation, for form finding, also for sourcing material, we wanted all of that connected. So we set up the central model in Flux, um, defined a data tree that everyone was using, and then at different points during the project, they could update the designs. 
some impressions from the design studio that we did um, long before COVID. Um, we also did it mostly online because I was traveling between Stuttgart and Hamburg. Um, and so it, it became a kind of challenge for different, for students from different departments, me traveling from half across Germany and also other experts which are invited to kind of all join this, this online co collaboration. Um, a lot of material tests were done. This was a bending active structure where you need to know a lot about the material performance. And all of that was then fed into one central script. I also collaborated here with Jonas Runberger from White Architecture. He, um, in his PhD, he developed a, a, a system of layers that he proposes for grasshopper scripts where it's uh, a very clear layout. So you always know by color coding and grouping who is working on what and what is the stage of the script that we're currently looking at. And we, we used this throughout the project and it was hugely helpful to organize all the data. Um, what you see here is just one aspect. That's the, the design model being coupled um, to an, a, a specific part of the form finding where we were looking at organizing the resultant directions of the cables and all of these models would then speak to each other or update each other in this um, central cloud-based system. And then finally, the idea was that there was these two separate sculptures hanging in the entrance of the university. They're not um, at all structurally connected. And we said we wanted to build them in such a way that these two um, co-planar rings that are local high points in these surfaces that they're perfectly in parallel and opposite each other. And uh, we wanted to measure through this whether we successfully managed to um, run the form finding and simulation correctly because that was something that we couldn't correct um, during the erection. And it uh, worked good enough. Um, we also had a lot of problem with some of the fire ratings for materials had to use some stiffer material than initially thought. Um, also couldn't get the, the um, CNC controlled cutting machine um, to cut this fire rate material. So we had to cut it by hand. Um, so a lot of um, little obstacles on the way. But the digital workflow setting this up, this is something that actually really worked. And uh, a lot later, I got feedback from some of the students who joined this course that today when they're working in offices on, on just standard um, building projects, um, which are dealt with through Revit BIM, that um, a lot of the stuff they learned then in this project about how careful you have to handle data, how you have to be aware of updates from colleagues and how you handle this whole design methodology, that that's something that they really learned through this project. And that's also something that I always found important in an academia context is that we're not trying to make professional lampshade designers and architects, um, but uh, we're really trying to find challenges in these small prototypes so we can train ourselves in, in um, finding out how to deal with these complexities. And finally, worked out, there were some wrinkles in the membrane, but the actual overall shape worked, worked out pretty well. And, um, it was certainly mostly a success in the collaboration between the students to learn how to deal with these kind of um, collaborative frameworks. I'll hand over to Mobin from here to share the next two projects. Well, thanks, Julian. Uh, so my name is Mobin, and I'm a PhD student uh, working at Tritbeck Center, as Julian mentioned, and I'm kind of really happy to work with Julian, like I, I, like on uh, on the upcoming projects. But uh, in these sessions, I just want I would like to shift it to more like robotic and like see how this co collaborative environment work out in the robotic fabrication. So I would start with my first uh, project. This is a um, my master thesis where we were looking at how we can uh, uh, try to connect the elements uh, or like found objects and develop a computational workflow to get the inputs, process them, and uh, kind of execute the robotic fabrication. So in the next slide, you can see that um, uh, we, we were processing the available project, uh, available material, and we had, a, as a designer, we had a 
kind of a design surface we wanted to achieve and we we, we established a generative design algorithm where there were like yeah, we were using search algorithm to to classifying them and after that form finding it and uh, kind of evaluating and select one option and execute it for robotic fabrication uh, where you can actually first detect the object and after that like perform the robotic uh, operations. So this was the general uh, uh, workflow that we established. And uh, we had the chance to, uh, to get some material and, uh, from a company with different uh, properties and different colors. And um, in the next slides, you can see how we scan these objects to input it for our generative uh, design algorithm. We extract the geometry and the properties uh, Properties was manual, but the geometry and the detection was it was done through a normal RGB camera. We, we created a catalog of data and we input that to the, our generative design uh, method or like a computer generative design. And what was quite important is that we all, as I mentioned, that we, we were dealing with the different properties uh, and different thicknesses. So like even the, if we wanted to do any operations of folding, uh, we, had, uh, we had to kind of know that uh, what is the spring back. And uh, so here I'm just gonna explain, I'm not going through the generative algorithm, but I'm, I will mostly touch on the robotic parts and how we, how we deal with it. Since we didn't have a scanner uh, on top of a laser cut and after that cutting everything and, uh, and folding it in the, in the industrial way, we come up with our own object manipulation or like the way that we want to fabricate. So we set the mark, we pick up the objects and put it and then fold it uh, like in a very DIY version. But this was allow us to, to make a workflow, robotic work, workflow where each object were first getting pre-scanned go through generative algorithm, then uh, marked, and then cut with the, with the hand manual hand cut and then drilled. And after that, we were putting it in the scan table and the robotic and the robot was executing the path uh, based on the pre-execution or like the cases that we defined. And after that, we used that to assemble a structure. Um, so in the next slide, uh, so we came up with our own, of course, uh, end effector for, for the robots because uh, you could not buy this one anywhere. So and to have these three functions uh, integrated. Uh, so here was our setup uh, that we had different. Uh, so we have, a, we have a server computer and two clients that the two clients was, uh, connect, were connected uh, to the server. And... Uh, and yeah, this one was, uh, this is the most important workflow because there we were like, it, it, it just shows that how we are sending data, which we, we, we were serializing it. And after that, each server were understanding the data and pass it to the other one. So I think uh, camera detect the QR code, taking the plane, sending it to the server. And after that, calling the case and sending it to the robot and, and back and forth. There was a back and forth between the robots and the detections of the object. And in the next slide, you can see that uh, we defined it some case for all of the objects. And as soon as uh, in this case, it was really important for us to get the orientation of the object. So uh, based on the QR code, we could define that and then uh, in the next slide, you could see that we were calling different cases in general in order to uh, adapt to the uh, to the uh, kind of uh, what what exists. Basically, if the if you put it on the table, you don't have to really predefine everything. So we have a kind of adaptive uh, input for the uh, robotic fabrication part. Yeah. So that was more or less uh, about the uh, the inputs, and here you could see our setup with the camera and also the, the planes and the uh, Fuduji uh, QR codes. Uh, and of course, afterwards, we mark it, uh, we mark each object based on the calculation that we had from the computational parts because we wanted to make a structure and after that we cut it. And basically after gripping each object user, using this pneumatic actuation that we, we, uh, we, we put it on the end effector, we bring it to the other uh, kind of 
base and do the operations ba uh, based on the cuts, based on the falling line uh, to get a desired uh, that kind of stiffness. And, and here you can see that we are kind of mimicking the industrial uh, version of it. Uh, so we used uh, like maximum two millimeter steels in order to be able to do it uh, with the payload of the KUKA that we had available. And here you can see the general workflow, how it was working. Of course, uh, we had two, we divided the whole uh, uh, the whole space to the two base. One was the scan and detection, where we, we had the cut objects and we had all of the information embedded based on the QR code. We are grab we are gripping it based on the orientation on the on the on the on the base, and then we are transporting it to the uh, to the to the other base. And in meanwhile, the server computer is sending it to the another client, and then the client was detecting it and calling the functions for the for the operations. And uh, yeah, and then we were using a big sheet of metal, uh, like very big plates of steel, in order to fold it uh, uh, in the in, in the marked area. Yeah, and this is this one was kind of uh, overall uh, uh, workflow, and we are yeah. So, and then of course we got a lot of materials in order to make a shell structure. And I didn't go through the generative computational, uh, computational, but we had, of course, we were form finding a, a structure, analyzing the structure and create a lot of options. And in the next slide, you can see that the user was selecting, uh, like we could understand what is our, we wanted to achieve a, can, a cantilever and we could see based on the material that we had, what can we achieve? And uh, we, we selected one, 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 uh, one of the structure uh, that has the lowest displacement, uh, uh, which means that it has more stable and least amount of cut off and uh, lowest amount of fabrication because you have maybe we had different fault lines or like different number of fault lines. And then we, uh, we thought that this is the kind of, uh, would be a good demonstration for the reusing object. And we managed to build this one computationally. So this one was just like giving a overview that uh, we managed to make a, a, a systematic approach. And in the next workshop where I had the chance to work with the IAC group, uh in the in the this summer school 2021 so we decided that if we have a week with the with the students and we are all remotely sitting in the different place because of corona why not making in this system as a collaborative environment uh so uh in the next slide uh, we had the idea that yeah let's let's have the same uh idea of using mosaic or like uh, random objects in order uh, to 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 make a make kind of a make a to explore this collaborative environment, and um, so basically this is kind kind of our computational workflow that uh, we we call kind of follow the same um, uh, 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 computational workflow where we had like sensing it using OpenCV and here we use Rust for, for, for kind of calculating the data and sending it to the design, uh, to the design process and then robotic fabrication. But here in this scenario, uh, uh, it, uh, we use a speckle, which was kind of a, a make our life easier uh, in, uh, for serialization and everything. And um, yes, and, and here is our, uh, here are more detailed uh, um, uh, workflow here you can see that the uh, how we how how we uh, use ROS for uh, exporting uh, the the data that we got from the camera and uh, using the server which was in in the IAC in Barcelona to send the data to the people sitting around the world so it's like uploaded using speckle and they were reading the data designing it they had different computational strategy for designing something and then sending it again from from different parts to the server again to the IAC sitting in IAC 
and then uh, and then uh, oh, by the way they will also do the path planning by themselves and then sending the path planning and uh, to us and then we managed to execute the path plan and it was good because in the next slide you could see that different people have this different interests so one could do the robotic parts one could do the uh, computational parts so it was really collaborative environment and we had different channels and speckles in order that for people to talk to each other using like really really like input and output because we define the system and a speckle may uh, like uh, gave us this opportunity to connect uh, every single part and um, in the next slide you could see that we had some tutorials for the generative design part we use dynamic relaxation we use uh, object orient programming and uh, we use different methods uh, as a tutorial so each person was free to to choose what uh, what to what uh, uh, what methods they want to do for the design parts and then basically in the last day of uh, workshop uh, we, we we kind of uh, start uh, hammering the mosaics and uh, and then giving the people these inputs uh, we sending them and then they within the group they were designing it sending it to nano, another person in the group and doing the path planning and sending us the data to execute the robot so in the in barcelona uh, i was not there by the way but they had uh, they set up this uh, uh, they set up this uh, design where they were put the random geometries here the rgb camera was detecting it and then uh, the gripper was also small pneumatic and then uh, executing the path plan and uh yeah and here we were all the time connected through zoom together and and at the end we we managed to 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 do the whole fabrication process in one day for almost 30 students which was kind of like uh <laughs> shows that it 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 worked quite well and uh i have to also give a lot of credits to the people in iac they worked really hard uh in order to make this uh happen and yeah it was one of the like i i didn't know i was not sure if it was working but it, it worked quite well and uh yeah it's uh it was amazing what we what we could do based if we have a system and after that use speckle to or like uh, any any like any connections to to connect uh uh, uh between the students and do this uh, uh yeah <laughs> whole workshop <laughs> and yeah and that was it i hand over to julian to uh to introduce the last project thank you yeah so uh, i started explaining about um this setting up a collaborative framework where a lot of people and experts can work at the same time on one problem and Mobin just showed you how to connect this um, to the fabrication environment. In the last project I want to share something that we're currently working on in, in the office, so, so more of an industrial perspective where we're having to deal with all of these problems, where we're, we're working on setting up in a, a design environment that allows us to collaboratively develop this project and at the same time um, keep the pipeline towards fabrication. The background is a, it's a museum in southern Germany. It's an old timber framework structure. The building burned in some 40 years ago. And um, since then, the space had been open. The neighboring timber frame buildings are, um, are leaning against this building. So you know that from the old timber frame buildings, they're usually totally skew and crooked. And because of this building missing, they were all starting to lean over. And um, temporarily, they put some big timber beams here on the side um, to support the neighboring buildings because it's all heritage. Um, in, in the competition, the architects came up with this idea to make a, a museum about the local culture of the city of Reutlingen and um, build a kind of modern version of a timber frame structure which is now actually a space frame because it works as a supporting structure again for the neighboring buildings. Sorry, I just had my phone into. Sorry, I just had to disconnect my phone. It was interfering with my headset. Um, 
Yeah, so the challenge is that the, the new geometry of the new building is also um, kind of not totally symmetric. So it kind of fits into this um, road with these old crooked buildings. So the roof is doubly curved, the facades are curved, and it's all slightly off angle, which leads to a challenge of building this uh, space timber frame with all different geometry, joining them um, without steel because it had to be or we, we have the aim to have it in the tradition of um, tradition uh, traditional joinery and um, this leads then to hugely complex connections um, classic mortars and tenon connections now um, just ever so much more complex because of the 3d um, way they're set up so um, that leads to an, a design methodology where we are have to collaborate very closely with the architectural models and we have to have the detailed design in mind from start because um, as if there's some engineers present who work in timber they know that what's usually decisive for the sizing of a timber member is the joint and not the section forces in the in the main span so we um, quite early in the design developed a, a method to categorize these different types of nodes um, and then evaluate their spring stiffnesses through 3D modeling them and, and doing tests and, and doing volume FE models and then sending that back into, um, into the structural model. And a, an important part of that is um, to have a, a methodology that works at a pretty high speed so you can actually design with it and not just wait for results for days on end. Um, you have to be able to calculate a lot of this stuff by hand. So this can be scripted and you know by plus minus 10 or 20 percent um, what the, the forces and the stiffnesses um, are that you're dealing with. And then you can pick out a few specific joints and take a lot of time modeling them very precisely in volume models. Um, with nonlinear material properties and, and, and all the, um, the, the screws are modeled as springs inside it. So you can really find out what the exact behavior of that node is. This is then mirrored to, uh, to real world testing. Um, so you know what, that, what you're calculating and what you're doing is actually giving you the correct results. So at this point, we have set up um, this environment. We know how to build these nodes and we're, um, putting this out for tender in the next couple of months. And uh, both the architect and the city are hugely scared that um, the prices that are coming back are tremendously high, which we're expecting is, is a possibility because of the high timber prices in Central Europe at the moment. But we don't want them to be exceedingly high because companies are scared about this complexity. So uh, when we talk to larger timber fabrication um, companies, they usually want to either take the project away from you and say, well, timber structures are hugely complicated. Engineers um, shouldn't be dealing with it by themselves. Let us do the job. Or they will say, um, uh, way too complex for us. Uh, it doesn't make sense. We can't do it. Or um, it won't be economic for us or whatever. So throughout this whole development, what we then decided to do is talk to the company Hundegger, which is one of the, the most um, known companies in the market for, um, for developing uh, CNC controlled milling and cutting machines for large timber structures. And uh, what you will have is that um, carpenters, um, small carpentry firms in, in Germany um, that can't afford one of these machines, they share these machines between multiple companies. And the aim for this relatively small project was that we want to make it um, competitive also for small carpentry workshops. So we worked directly with this company Hundegger to um, find out whether all the parts that we are designing can be produced with one of their basic machines. And that means what's being put out for tender now is um, a, a CAD model in the typical um, timber engineering software CAD work that's been used mostly in Germany, Switzerland and Austria at the moment that has a direct link to this Hundegger machine. Um, and 
what, what that means at the end is that already now we're having to link up all these different software environments. And as I was saying in the beginning, behind each software uh, are people. And so we have the teams of architects that are working on the general design. Um, we can collaborate directly with that Revit model they're building um, with our FEM software. We can also link Rhino inside and Grasshopper into the um, into the Revit model at the moment to generate these more complex geometries. And then we found a way to um, to um, to connect Rhino to this CatWork software, and then finally to this Hundega software. And what we are thinking about at the moment, um, through our positive experiences here at university, is to find a way that we can link all of this in a central model through Speckle. But this is um, something that I guess we have to discuss with the Speckle people directly. But it kind of gives you maybe an understanding of how um, in such a project at, at this um, relatively small scale, yet a high complexity, um, we have to use very specific different software packages. And the challenges are um, in the communication between the software environments and between the people um, so that this can run smoothly throughout all design phases. We call this hybrid modeling because um, what we're doing is we're not using one mega software package that we spend a ton of money on. And we say we try to do everything with this one package, but we really pick the different softwares um, that are best for their, um, for their tasks and try to connect them. So if you think about this challenge of, of taking different tools and combining them into one, um, which is what, what hybrids are, you take two parental systems, join them, and then the third hybrid system that comes out of that should have some higher performance. Um, so what you could end up with is that you try to squeeze all the function into one tool, which is what this camping um, cutlery is doing. <clears throat> and unless you're Italian, uh, you probably know that it's it's really not very good to eat spaghetti with this spoon, fork, knife, everything in one. Um, and it's it's to my understanding, it's a bit like this also with software that we're using. It's not necessarily the correct answer to try and squeeze all the function into one software, but rather find a solution where you can have specific tools for specific tasks. And sometimes chopsticks are just the best uh, cutlery to use to to eat Chinese food or a pizza knife to eat pizza or a lobster fork for for um, shellfish or whatever you want. And the, the challenge is in, in connecting all of these environments so they can be used in, in, a, in a hybrid modeling approach. That's where we're at now. Um, there's a lot of challenges with every project. There's huge expenses also involved when we go back here and you have to pay for these um, especially these BIM tools. Um, and that's why from an office perspective, we're also really wanting to push this, this more open software approach um, where small companies can also make a difference in this AEC market. That's what we wanted to share. And we're happy and open for questions. I'm just reading the questions here. No, there's, there's just someone is hungry for hybrid modeling. Um, <laughs> that was probably more reference to the cutlery. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, thank you guys very much for the presentation. Um, I don't see anything in the Q&A, but maybe we can give it a moment and see if anyone has any questions. Oh, Mateo has a question. Let's, oh, can I? Highlight. That's probably for, for Mobin. Yeah, so what was the biggest challenge coordinating between two universities via Speckle? Um, so I think, I think in general, uh, the idea of the Speckle was, I mean, to be honest, I also, I, had, I haven't used it. Uh, and last year, we, 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 uh, Julian asked me to, to, uh, to do a workshop and he told me that what if you do it collaborative, but I mean, it was Corona time and 
and I, I didn't know what to do. And, uh, and I start like asking people around what is the only option. And that was the moment that I, I, I realized Speckle was, people are using it. So, but they were using it within one university. So that's, that's why I see the, uh, I, I see it as a challenge or like also as an opportunity that when I start using the Speckle, I, I, this, uh, uh, and then uh, offer it to the someone else the, the whole uh, working environment was a kind of change because the the syllabus of the workshop that that we uh, defined it in the workshop was that okay we give the students the package to install linux and then they can also install ros on it and then they can do the packs uh, simulate the path uh, and stuff like that but we just then realize what if we just kind of decentralize everything and just put like connect them together through like through something which in that moment we realized speckle was the best choice for us because i mean it's just a serialization matter and if you dis define the system everything will work and in that moment after working with speckle i like just because it's also environmental I like it's a, has a very easy and friendly um, interface we kind of start using it in the workshop as something to connect uh, everything together and the students were also like kind of uh, really understood it and then that's why i from i pass it from my workshop that i did one year ago uh, in castle university and then we start a collaboration to iac and we we managed to have this uh, workshop and yeah i hope that was the answer of this question or like i hope that i could address uh the challenges and but i think i i do believe that this thing or like this have will have a effect also in the future and uh everyone will start using uh <laughs> speckle hopefully <laughs> or not not speckle but just any software that allow us to kind of connect everything and yeah <laughs> but we are also keen on really speckle <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah so there's a question by Elsa, I think um, so. Less spe speckle specific, but more more of an open answer. I think the biggest challenge is really in in learning to work in this um, collaborative design um, for the people that are involved, because um, problem solving um, just becomes a totally different task. Because you're on the one hand, you're in constant communication. You have to make sure that everyone is working on. On, on, the, on the most recent and updated and correct data. And on the other hand, you also have a huge responsibility to deliver in time and you can't hide any, any problems. So I felt that when we were doing it with students, that at, at moments they were getting totally stressed out because they were, they were working in this, you know, in this glass cell. There were no longer the students with their headphones on that could just work through the night and somehow figure it out with some rough, messy coding, maybe to, to just get this thing running or just manipulate it by hand. It just kind of puts a totally different stress level to the design in one sense. In another sense, it also um, is, is amazing how then the communication is hugely motivating for everyone. And what we see at university, I can, I can say that I see the exact same thing in the office. But when you work like this in the office, it now brings us to legal questions. So if someone messes up part of the central information model because of the data they loaded into it, whose responsibility is it? And then you get back um, to what we already have established in BIM, a BIM manager that you also need. And I heard this in the parallel session earlier on, that you also need a manager for the collaboration platform. So in this case, a speckle manager. So the person that behind this process, again, um, that it can't be left alone on the computer, but you need people who then control the communication. That's kind of what I've noticed so far, um, that that's the biggest challenge. And the answer is you need people also, um, not only behind every software, but also in the interfaces. Uh... Uh, there's also a question from Nima about why, uh, what role Revit had in the workflow. So, what do you need? Uh, why do you need to connect the model to Revit? And is it the is it an only timber structure? Um, it, it is an only timber structure, um, and 
what it is it is based in in the context of existing buildings so where it's it's interconnected with an old cellar and the neighboring buildings and what we see is that bim software um has a huge potential when you use it in constructing in an already built environment because you can uh, load all the data that you need into one central model so that geometry is not just geometry but it's also data about chemical hazards that might be present or um, degradation of, of structural members um, which are all being tested so we need this central data um, base that stores all this information that when people go into the buildings, do the testing, do the scanning, that all of this has a place to be. That's where we see that um, these central BIM models work really well. That, and that, that's why it's being used. And on the other hand, I've, I've just seen that offices that are using Revit, um, they just use it all the time now because um, stuff that could be done with other software, they just still use Revit because they have all the licenses. So it's, it's not always, BIM because it's the best tool to do, but it's just a methodology that you've introduced in the workflow and then you just keep using it. I think there is also one question in Q&A from Joshua. Uh, so he asked that what was the name of the project again? Uh, has it been published also? He's interested to know about this element detailing. Is there an element of function modeling or booleans? Uh, so I think he's more like asking about the detailing and how, uh, yeah, what is the role of speckled in the detail? <laughs> um, so it, the project hasn't been published yet, um, just in, in talks, but not on in papers because it's still being developed and it hasn't been constructed yet. We've built some um, prototypes together with Bluma Lehmann. Um, and it's it's now next year going on the market for tender. Um, it's uh, the project is called OAR Museum in Reutlingen, and um, indeed the modeling is based on solids and and, and boolean operations. Um, when you try to solve it, um, kind of hands on, which is which is an analog process. Um, trying to figure out how that geometry works, but then it's transferred into a system line based logic because in, in our structural models, in the global models, we don't deal with solids, but we deal with system lines and cross sections. And that also makes the, um, makes the whole process a little bit easier to handle because you don't work with these huge 3D models, but you work with system lines, um, which is just a line with properties. And at, at the line ends, where they're intersecting with the other lines, you measure the angles and you, you give a kind of yield to a certain line that ha has to run through because it has um, uh, because it has a higher force and it has to run through the node maybe. Um, so you can organize all of this just based on numbers and lines. And then when you measure all the angles, you can take that back and then generate the 3D node. But it's it's all based on a on a system line approach. So you don't 3D model it per se, which would be a very slow model. Where speckle comes in in the detailing, I don't know yet. Um, we've really just started discussing whether it would help us to um, to foster this collaboration. Great, thank you both. Um, if there aren't any more questions, maybe we can you can just say some parting words and then we could close up the session a little bit early. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I would answer uh, uh, one question in terms of the uh, data integration and methods for communication. I mean, uh, it's maybe I get more a bit specific, like a bit more like programming not okay. that too much, but more like a bit, maybe if someone is out. Uh, because I, I just realized, for example, like when you're programming, you're really uh, like, you're really keen on to make a repository and after that collaborate, everyone uh, like push and pull and fork and stuff like that. But I think that somehow in the architecture, it's getting a trend as well. But what we, what I was like, what I really like about Speckle, because it allows you to have the same sort of 
uh, systematic working where you have different branches and then you can actually integrate with the data as well as the programming. So it's sort of like a programming environment for architects or like <laughs> someone who is like really new to their programming through web base. But mm -hmm. I, I, and then uh, I also get more specific because Julian picked us in a really good point. Maybe I'll pick up this and echo it again because it's really important to work on the update model all the time because you don't want to kind of uh, work on the old model all the time. I think what we did is that we had different speckle, like in general, like different speckle. And then one was only the execution one, the main model, that it has different branches, that all of the branches were all the time updated when the people are sure to pull something. So I think that was the only thing that uh, was quite important for us because we didn't want to all the time ask, hey, is the model up till hit or not? But we knew that like through the comments, they were confirming that's the one that they want to send and everything was perfect. So this one was more about the programming and uh, the uh, repository, uh, beginner programmer, architect <laughs> and engineer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was what I wanted to Mention. Can I ask a bit of a follow-up question to that? Um, can I just ask how uh, you go about like setting up your speckle streams? I'm kind of wondering about your like project structure and how you organize your data within a stream or within several streams. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I think that was exactly what Julian was presenting at the beginning. So we had this color coding in Grasshopper. So mm -hmm. Grasshopper was kind of the design part of uh, the design part. And we were like basically getting uh, like uh, the the serialization and then we were constructing everything again in Grasshopper for doing a design and after that exporting everything from Grasshopper. So the students and you're were all more keeping it in one stream together yeah, just with different yeah. branches. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that the so that the students were only dealing with one thing because that makes the whole environment kind of easy and friendly to use. Because if you tell the students that okay, let's go to the other part, uh, then I think it's not going to be, uh, yeah, you have to use the people as their individual and their skills and then connect them together. So of course, maybe they didn't know what was Speckle exactly doing, how they were, we were serializing the data, but what they knew that what they get is through Speckle and yeah. Uh, yeah. So I hope that's kind of uh, explained a, a bit of uh, challenges. Uh, yeah. Great stuff. Thank you for expanding on that. Uh, do you have any final words, Julian? Yeah, thanks for having us. It's, this is a really cool uh, conference. Exciting to hear all these different perspectives. Um, also great to see that this Hopin platform really works with questions and answers. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have more questions and, and uh, interesting debates here than I sometimes have at an ISS live conference. So it's pretty good. So congratulations to you guys um, for setting all of this up. Thank you both very much for coming. Really appreciate the presentation. Thank you for having us. All right. Bye, guys. Ciao. All right, Mobin, I need to jump to Fachbereichsrat. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'll join a later session again, maybe. All right, then I will also great. continue my cool. workshop. Okay. Ciao. Have a nice day. Ciao.